You'll often hear people say, oh, well, functional medicine's not realistic because we can't afford it. It's too expensive. And I, I agree with that with the caveat that it's, it's too expensive for the individual. You know, it, we can't expect the average person to be able to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on a, an appointment with a functional medicine clinician and running that kind of testing. It is feasible to do within the healthcare system, but the amount of change that has to happen in terms of realigning incentives, getting the pharmaceutical influence out of medicine, at least to the extent that it is now today, restructuring the whole healthcare system, it's a massive undertaking. What's up guys, welcome to the Invictus Mindset Podcast. Today's guest is a health detective specializing in investigative medicine. He's a New York Times best-selling author, teacher, podcaster, and blogger. He's the creator of ChrisCresser.com and the founder of Adapt Naturals. Today, I'm excited to peel back the curtain with Chris Cresser. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Bryce. It's a pleasure to be here. Really excited to chop it up with you today. You've been doing some really cool things in the space with numerous appearances on Rogan and a plethora of other podcasts. And... You've really been doing some some cool things in the world of functional medicine. So thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really happy to be here. As, as we both know, there's there's so much nuance. There's so much complexity in the world of of healthcare and nutrition and diet and exercise and lifestyle. There seems to be an absurd amount of conflicting methodologies and whatnot. And hopefully we can leave our, our listeners today with maybe some guidelines and some general principles that can help steer them in the right direction on their journey. How's that sound? Sounds great. Happy to help. Something you've talked about a little bit is just this, like the biggest challenge today being chronic disease and that just conventional Western medicine is is really not hitting the nail on the head as to how to attack this. I'd love to co- start the conversation here. And how did you come to this, this resolution? Uh, well, it was a number of different factors. First was I suffered myself from a debilitating chronic illness that started in my early 20s. I was traveling around the world surfing in Indonesia and got sick with a tropical illness that mm. evolved into a, a debilitating chronic condition. And I saw over 30 doctors in a span of three years in four different countries um, trying to figure out what was going on. And all of them were well-meaning and did their best to help. But what was quickly apparent was that the conventional modern healthcare system was not set up to deal with long-term chronic health issues like that. Uh, if you look back in the history of how our medical system developed, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, the top causes of death were all acute infectious diseases and injuries, like somebody getting injured in a work, workplace setting, for example. So these are acute traumatic situations, and our medical system evolved to deal with those very well. And it still, it still does. I mean, it's, it's quite miraculous in, in some ways. Like we can reattach limbs. We can restore sight to the blind. If I get hit by a car, I definitely want to be taken to the hospital, you know, and, and to deal with that injury there. But what, that's, those are no longer the top causes of death uh, in the United States. Seven of ten of the top causes of death are now chronic health conditions like cardiovascular disease, uh, obesity, metabolic disease, cancer, and things like that. These are diseases that unfold over years or even decades, and they are predominantly driven by diet and lifestyle. And uh, you know, I think most people listening to this will, will relate. Like, if you go to your doctor, the average length of the visit is eight to ten minutes. There's not enough time in that visit to eat, to, there's barely enough time to say hello and get a prescription written. Uh, there's certainly not enough time to dive into your diet and lifestyle and, and figure out what's actually causing the chronic condition and address it. And so we have the wrong tool for the job, essentially. We have a, a, a medical system that is phenomenal at dealing with acute 
emergency situations or end of life care, but is absolutely terrible at dealing with the problem that that is is driving uh, early death and poor quality of life as we age. So so that's really it. Seems it to be keeping nutshell. people alive, but not really getting them to thrive. Yeah, and it, and it sounds that's... like there's. There's a little bit of a discrepancy here where you mentioned eight to 10 mis- minutes in the initiation or the connection with the patient. Not enough time to take in the inputs of lifestyle orientation, nutrition, sleep, movement, uh, maybe, maybe a historical reference. It's very general. And I also want to credit doctors because it's not necessarily their fault. They're six figures deep in student loan debt. They've got pressure to hit certain quotas of certain patients within a day. They've got pressure of legalities to make sure their paperwork is optimized, that there's not medical malpractice issues. There's tons of push from big pharma to integrate certain prescriptions to solve the problem. And for lack of a better analogy, put a picture over the hole in the wall. And, you know, there's a lot going on here to gently untangle and unpack and you've mentioned three components that you that you really think can help serve and build a better system the first one being an ancestral diet and lifestyle the second one being functional medicine and then the third one that collaborative practice model with with health coaches nutritionists and various health experts that can play the role of supporter is that kind of something that you're still leaning into as far as a solution oriented model Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I echo your, uh, what you said about individual doctors. I mean, I've had the honor of, of training uh, several hundred healthcare providers, including doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, you know, every license type you can imagine in, in 50 countries around the world. So I talk to doctors and other providers every day, and I know that in, in virtually all cases, they are suffering just as much from the inequities of the current healthcare system as patients are. And they would love to practice in a different way. And many are, are practicing in a different way. They're, they're either leaving their conventional medicine practice uh, and starting a functional medicine practice or something like that, or they're doing their best to change how they're practicing within the constraints of the system that they're in. Uh, but it's absolutely true that, that these are systemic problems that have deep roots and lots of different causes. And so it's not really in the, in the capability of any single individual, whether they're a patient or a provider, to solve them. We have to address it on a societal scale. And that three-step plan, or at least you know, three categories of intervention that you outlined from, from my book, Unconventional Medicine, I do think that is... Uh, if we were able to implement those three steps on a broad scale, we would dramatically reduce the incidence of chronic disease and save hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars uh, in healthcare expenditures. And there are statistics and research to to back that up that I present in the book. But this is a, a real... Um, this is of utmost importance because we know that healthcare expenditures are just continuing to rise. They're consuming a greater and greater portion of our national budget. And there's a really an existential threat here that some people have pointed out that if, if healthcare expenditures do continue to rise at the current pace, then they could conceivably consume our entire federal budget by the year 2050. That's from an estimate from the Congressional Budget Office. So this is not just an individual problem in terms of our own quality of life and health care, although that's a big part of it. It's, it's a problem that is going to impact all of us in some way or another in our lifetime. I mean, let's also raise our eyebrows for a moment that 2050 is not that far away. No. And, and really taking into consideration the concept that are we in the, in the business of truly trying to provide patient care or are we trying to make money? Because a patient that gets a cure is no longer a patient. Trident Coffee is sponsoring this episode of the Invictus Mindset Podcast. My guys over at Trident taught me something really important this last year. That we are all a bundle of stories, both good and bad, 
and everything in between. At Trident, they're storytellers. All of their cold brews remind their customers that, that they are part of something bigger than themselves. They help create connections through symbology and storytelling that engage their customers on an emotional level, and this distinguishes them from other coffee brands. You can find Trident in Imperial Beach and in Coronado. They offer over 14 plus nitro cold brews along with dairy-free options. You can find the perfect brew and pair it with one of their treats from their keto bakery. All these options will allow you to support your health and fitness journey with Trident Coffee. They're more than just a coffee company. You can check them out over at tridentcoffee.com and use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Once again, that's tridentcoffee.com. Use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Take your coffee experience to the next level. Two important factors for us over at Invictus Mindset are true care and attention to detail. My friends over at RX Mark here have been bringing innovative fitness tools to the market since 2009. From their award-winning Evo speed ropes to their amazing gymnastics grips to their line of inflatable fitness equipment, they're constantly looking to problem solve within the fitness industry. They're always allowing us to have our gear work for us rather than against us. Hop on over to RX Mark Gear and use discount code Invictus Mindset to shop their latest cutting edge gear. Have your gear work with you and not against you. Right? We've all seen some of these memes and things floating around social media, but I, I feel like there's a little bit of truth to that narrative around wanting to get the quick fix. The quick fix comes with an onslaught of side effects and then you treat the symptoms rather than the under under arching problem. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it's a problem that exists on both sides. On the one hand, patients are not getting the support they need when they go to see their doctor or healthcare provider. And again, I I don't blame the individual providers for that. That's a systemic problem. But on the other hand, I I think it's also true that we've trained patients to expect that all health problems can be solved with a pill or in some cases a surgical procedure. And that's simply not true, (laughs) especially in the case of these chronic problems that unfold over years or decades and that are primarily driven by diet and lifestyle factors. So it's it's a double-edged sword um, because a lot of people have just grown accustomed to to that idea, and there, uh, you know, the doctors that I work with and train will tell you, you know, they often say things to me like, "I would love for my patients to adopt an ancestral <laughs> diet and lifestyle, but they're just not willing to do that. Uh, they're, they're expecting me to write a prescription, and if I don't write a prescription, they're upset when they leave the office, and they'll just go find another doctor who will." So I do think it's it's a it's a multidimensional problem and and you know it needs to be addressed on multiple fronts. One of course is education starting as early as possible with kids and helping them to understand that health is a is a, is a is a practice for them as well. It's something that they have to engage with on a daily basis. It's not something that's delivered passively in a pill from a doctor. I love the way you described that with the term practice and that it's something that needs to be honed and fostered every single day. I think there's great ideology there sharing that with the younger generations. And you know, some of these older generations, especially the baby boomers, are absolutely pushed or were pushed to that narrative that a pill or a surgery can solve their problems. And uh, I, I really think that the way you described it being a st- systemic issue is is very important there because it's not any one person's fault by any means. But I do want to take a moment to really define this ancestral diet and lifestyle that you're alluding to. I'm assuming that also encompasses a little bit of the nine ancestral tenets that many people have leaned into, um, popularized most recently by Liver King around sleep, eat, move, shield, connect, exposure to cold and sunlight, fight, and bond which seem to be pretty primal styles of living, if, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, I, I would go along with most of those. I, I don't 
know how much how important fighting is, depending on how 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 broadly you define that. But I, I think there are a few key things that I want to highlight here, um, especially because because of Liver King and other folks, um, the the ancestral diet and lifestyle concept now has some baggage associated with it. Yeah, totally um, fair. But the the fundamental principle is one that any evolutionary biologist would agree with, which is that all species are adapted to survive and thrive in a particular environment. And if you remove the species from that environment and put them in a completely different environment quickly before they you know, have enough time to adapt, you're going to cause problems. So imagine a, a species of bacterium that has adapted to thrive in, in, in deep in the ocean next to hydrothermal vents. If you take that bacteria and drop it in a shallow tide pool, it's going to die. And the same thing would happen if you took a, vi- a bacterium from the tide pool and put it next, you know, deep in the ocean next to a hydrothermal vent. And that might seem like an extreme example, but when you look at human beings, we evolved in a particular environment over millions of years. If you go back to ho- you know hominid extend before we were technically human and we were hominids, we're looking at 2.5 million years, thousands and thousands of generations. We ate primarily meat, fish, starchy tubers, nuts and seeds, wild fruits and vegetables. We lived outdoors in the natural rhythms of light and dark in close-knit tribal communities. We moved around a lot to get our food, to hunt, to fight, to your, you know, to, 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 to your point. And this was just the, the default mode of human existence for the vast majority of our evolution. It's only been within the last 100 150 years that we shifted to this industrial way of life that we all feel is normal right now, but it's anything but normal. It's far outside of what is normal for human beings. And I'm not suggesting that we need to sleep out in the backyard in a loincloth, you know, in order to get the benefits of an ancestral lifestyle. But I am saying that you cannot make that dramatic of a switch you know, take uh, us as an organism out of our ancestral normal environment that we adapted to over millions of years and just drop us in a completely different environment and not expect problems. That's a recipe for problems. That mismatch between our genes and our biology and the environment that we're living in is what is driving virtually all modern chronic diseases today. It's such a great point, especially as we see the growth and development of the technological revolution and artificial intelligence and all the things on on screens which I'm tremendously appreciative of for moments like this where we can connect I'm very appreciative to connect with family and friends via FaceTime but there's this artificial world out there that I think is creating problems with our with our biology creating a narrative in between our ears that quite frankly, misses a lot of the different components of the ancestral lifestyle. How does, how does that kind of play a role? And what are your thoughts as we're living in this age of a gentle change in environment? This episode is brought to you by HVMN, Health Via Modern Nutrition. They launched the world's first ketone drink in 2017. And then in 2022, launched the version 2 of their exogenous ketone product line called Ketone IQ. I found that incorporating ketones into my morning routine increased my daily focus and energy. The beauty of this product is that you can stack it. It doesn't even have to replace your morning routine. My morning routine looks like taking the dog on a walk, hitting my daily shot of Ketone IQ, hopping in the cold plunge, and then finishing it off with a nice Trident coffee while I soak up some morning sunlight. Try out some ketones for yourself by using the code INVICTUS for 20% off Ketone IQ. Ketones are a super efficient fuel for your brain that leaves you feeling energized and clear-headed. Give it a shot. I promise you won't regret it. Once again, use code INVICTUS for 20% off Ketone IQ. Move fast and break shit. This is one of the core values at LSKD and something that we fully resonate with here at the Invictus Mindset Podcast. 
LSKD develops functional sportswear with a streetwear aesthetic that's on a mission to inspire you to chase the vibe through sport, fitness, and adventure. Through my experiences with LSKD products and their team members, I have found a brand that I can call home that keeps me performing at my highest level through fitness and business. I train daily in the rep shorts and love the versatility they offer so I can go from training at the gym directly to meetings, client consults, running errands, or preparing for podcasts. The LSKB vibe has finally reached San Diego, and we want you to experience it too. Go to us.lskd.co to start shopping today. We want to inspire you to chase the vibe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think in some ways it's been gentle, in some ways it's been violent, <laughs> the, the change in Great environment. Point. And, and um, you know, you, these, your, your example of screens is, is, I think, reflective of that. It, it was not that long ago, so I'm, I'm 48. So I, I'm one of the last generations that can remember a screen-free existence in youth. You know, in college, I didn't have a phone, I, or, or you know, anyone who had a phone, it was a flip phone. I remember my dad getting a car phone. It was this huge brick thing, you know, <laughs> that they put in the car, and um, and and now, you know, that's over. Like every every kid who's been born in the last 15 or 20 years has just grown up with these personal devices. And when you talk about a massive sea change in environment, it's hard to imagine something that has had a more dramatic impact on our day-to-day -day existence than screens. You know, the average kid and average adult is spending multiple hours uh, interacting with a two-dimensional screen. And that in and of itself doesn't mean it's bad, but we have to at least look at it because it's so far outside of the norm of human evolution that we need to consider what the long-term effects of that are. And as you said, Bryce, there are many benefits that are undeniable. You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation without that technology. I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do, sharing the information that I share without that technology. Uh, so I'm not a Luddite in that respect. I, I appreciate the benefits and, and can see the value that they've added to human society and discourse. And I'm also not a Pollyanna, you know, like we have to, we have to also be willing to see the dark side, to, to lift, lift up the rug and see the impact that, that, that the screens are having on, on our health and well-being, particularly kids, the increase in sedentary behavior, the decline in, in exercise, the increase in depression and mental health problems amongst teenagers, particularly teenage girls, which were, was amplified during the pandemic. Um, because of the dramatic increase in screen use. Um, there's even physical injuries that, are, that have increased, like neck, you know, uh, neck problems and thumb and joint problems that due to the increase in these screens and, and the use of screens. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a, a great microcosm, macrocosm example of how and we could go down the line with a lot of the changes in the modern world that they're not all bad because if they were, we wouldn't, they wouldn't have stuck around, right? They have mm -hmm. some benefits. Like how about even just artificial light, <laughs> you know, like uh, the uh, uh, in invention of the light bulb and our the ability to be able to see at night beyond a candle it was a pretty massive change. And it enabled all kinds of things that, uh, we were not able to do prior to that. But the downside of that has been, we now know that too much exposure to artificial light at night, particularly from screens, suppresses our melatonin production, increases cortisol, disrupts our sleep, disrupts circadian rhythm, interferes with metabolic <laughs> health, has all these downstream effects that Thomas Edison, who created the <laughs> light bulb, had never would have imagined in a million years. So... I just I think it's important to just have a nuanced and open conversation about all of these things so that we can maybe not give up the benefits of these shifts and changes in the modern world, but but work to mitigate their negative impacts. And that's kind of largely what my work has been uh, focused on over the past 10, 15 years. So well said. I think there's definitely a yin to the yang. There's lightness with darkness. 
And I, I really do believe that there's a lot of benefits to the technological revolution. But I also think that you phrased it very well with one word. It's a tool, right? Let's use the light bulb as an example. It's a tool to continue working when there's not sufficient light and to continue seeing and innovating. But when that tool is abused, right, when, when we've created pharmaceuticals to help solve a problem, but when that tool is once again abused and then manipulated for growth trajectory within capitalism and trying to reap the benefits of money, I, I feel like there's something to the, the psychological consumerism around some is good, more is better. And there's this obsession around trying to get more, be more, have more. And I don't know that biology works that way. I don't know that our, our health and well-being necessarily wants more. It wants homeostasis, not, not peaks, not valleys, not too much cortisol, not too much insulin. But it's all about harmonizing and this ratio and dosage or, as the world likes to describe it, this, this pursuit of balance. Well, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question because balance, I, I'm a believer in balance, but I think it can also be a, a cop-out or mm. a catchphrase that's used to divert attention from some of the, the real issues. Um, so let's see if I can use an example. If you look at uh, recommendations, let's go, let's use the screen time. <laughs> Uh, example like I'm a parent I have a daughter who's 11 years old and uh, we have been quite strict in our in our approach to her screen use because I I'm aware of the what the research suggests and I think that there are more downsides to upsides to her being using screens extensively at this point and when you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics and their recommendations the recommendations have changed over the past few years, but it's not because the research has changed. It's because they're trying to be, and, and they've even said this, and, and when they update the guidelines, they're trying to be more balanced or more realistic in, in their guidelines. In other words, they recognize that parents are ignoring the guidelines and letting their kids use screens at a much earlier age than they recommend. So instead of you know, trying to educate parents more about that. They're just changing the guidelines to be more mm. balanced. Um, so I know that's not what you were referring to specifically, but it, it's worth pointing out that yeah. there are some things that, that where, where balance is not necessarily the right approach or, or a sort of like moderate approach is not necessarily the best option where we're actually holding the line and and being strong with our boundaries because those those boundaries are were established for a reason mm -hmm. is is the best approach and i i think that that can get lost in this sort of you know false equivalence where like you see a news program and they have one person talking about one side of the issue and that person is completely could be completely supported by the scientific literature everything we know about a topic then they just have someone to represent the other side, but that person's not informed at all and doesn't have any evidence or, you know, actual experience behind them. And that, that's a sort of false balance, sense of balance that gets created there. So Absolutely. again, I, not I think exactly that's a really, what you, you asked, but worth, worth talking about. No, for sure. I think it's a good argument. And I love the concept of holding the standard and, and keeping the line, the line, because when you look at something as simple as connecting, most people that consume a device since the, the onset of their life don't really understand true human connection. They lack a little bit of emotional intelligence because they're not really observing and feeling the frequency that another human operates at because they're so used to telecommunicating via text or email, Snapchat, different forms that way. The days of, of knocking on your neighbor's door and asking if they want to play are, are a little bit gone. Having to call on a landline and speak to a parent before you speak to the kid are kind of gone. Um, you can text to figure out where everybody was versus the grounding and exploration of, hey, where, whose front yard has all the bikes in front of it? And, you know, late night play, 
of capture the flag and hide and go seek and you know tinkering and innovating to try to create new games and combining of games some of that's a little bit of a lost art because of the the fears and the dangers that are richly solicited and and the narratives that are sold via social media something i like to say is um modern day we're we're really rich in knowledge but we're poor in experience and with that being said i mean you could lead that same concept into diet and lifestyle where people will read something and it'll be the highlight topic of of the article and they'll just immediately assume like oh that that product is not good or that food is not good without taking a customizable approach and trying it themselves and using themselves as a guinea pig or exploring into the research and ideology and genetic um, di- different angles that are typically popularized on things like PubMed or, you know, it's just something that's really opened my eyes a lot. And I think a lot of your work encompasses at least creating a little bit of clarity. And, and as you talked about pulling up the rug and kind of looking underneath a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. With that being said, man, I'd love to also define for people just the differences between the different types of medicine. We've referenced uh, Western medicine. We've referenced functional medicine. I think there's also an argument for naturopathic medicine and just kind of understanding what some of these tribes of medicine are. Yeah, it's a good question. And as you can imagine, somewhat heated and controversial, like so many other topics in in this field. Everything's so polarizing these days, man. (laughs) This, so, you know, conventional medicine or sometimes is referred to allopathic medicine. Western medicine is another synonym. So this is the dominant paradigm of medicine that is practiced in the United States and elsewhere in the industrialized world. So it's, you know, it's, Every, every, almost everyone listening to this has experienced it. Um, it's what we grew up with here in this country, and it's, it's the typical form of medicine that's practiced. I, I'd also like to point out that it's also, correct me if I'm wrong, the one that is connected to your health insurance and your health care. And many people are penalized on their taxes for not having you know, certain you know, health diagnostics or whatever the prerequisites are. So there's definitely a um, humble push in that type of medicine, I would say. Yeah. It's also objectively accurate to say that it is um, predominantly supported by and infiltrated by uh, pharmaceutical industry. So Mm two-thirds of medical research is supported by big pharma and – you know, it's it's impossible to talk about conventional medicine and how it works without understanding the influence of pharmaceutical companies on everything from uh, research, as I just mentioned, to regulatory agencies that uh, many have argued have been captured by the pharmaceutical industry. We have the revolving door problem where, you know, people from regulatory agencies like the FDA get, a, you know, go right straight from there to uh, cush well-paid positions at pharmaceutical companies. And, yep, you know, we that, saw that, that with Pfizer. Absolutely. And that, again, in and of itself doesn't guarantee uh, that there's going to be a problem. But one of my favorite quotes is from Upton Sinclair, who said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary is dependent on him not understanding it. And, uh, you know, there have been many studies, actually, that do link... Uh, the who, who funded the study to the outcome. You know, the, if, if the study was funded by a pharmaceutical company, it's much more likely to uh, to have a positive result than a study that's publicly funded. So this is not just stuff that, you know, we're speculating on. There's There's real research to suggest. And I think most people, just common sense would indicate <laughs> that, you know, if you have... Uh, Pfizer is sponsoring, um, you know, spending millions of dollars on commercial advertisements for a television network, then that network might be less likely to run any critical content about Pfizer, right? That's, that's just, again, that's just human nature. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, yep. And it's, 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 econo- it's just straight up economics and market capitalism. So, um, yeah, I think that that's all truth of conventional medicine or Western allopathic medicine, whatever you want to call it. And then um, I, I would p- 
I would I would use the umbrella. So another umbrella would be traditional medicine. So these are systems of medicine that have been existence in existence for often thousands of years. Traditional Chinese medicine or TCM is a great example. Ayurvedic medicine is another example. Um, African systems of, of medicine. They're, they're all over the world, there are traditional systems of medicine that predated uh, Western allopathic medicine and are still in broad in wide usage in many of those countries. And, and now in, in the U.S. and other industrialized countries, people uh, seek out those traditional systems of medicine as an alternative to uh, conventional medicine. And then another category, and this is the one that I would put functional medicine in and naturopathic medicine in, would, you could broadly call integrative medicine. So that is an attempt to integrate insights and learnings from traditional systems of medicine with insights and learnings from allopathic and Western medicine. And, you know, naturopathic medicine, functional medicine are different in some ways, but they're similar in many ways as well. I would say the, what functional medicine is really predominantly concerned with is a, identifying and addressing the root cause of the problem and looking at the body in a systems-based way. So instead of seeing the body as a collection of different parts, uh, all of which need to be a, uh, treated separately. So in, in conventional medicine, you go to one doctor for your foot, <laughs> you go to another doctor for your gut, you go to another doctor for anything happening in your, in your brain Not or nervous system. Not to mention, though, like the time frame, right? If you go in to see a doctor, they need to refer you to a specialist, which then takes time. LMNT, pronounced element, is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means a science-backed electrolyte ratio with none of the junk. No sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and most importantly, no BS. Whether it's after a long workout, hot yoga, or an intense sauna and ice session, I've been using Element to keep me hydrated and replenishing all of my lost electrolytes. So many of us wake up chronically fatigued, and the antidote to this is salt water. Salt has previously been blamed for blood pressure issues, but new research shows that replenishing salt and electrolytes can lead to more energy, no headaches, a clear mind, and enhanced focus. Use the link drinklmnt.com slash Invictus Mindset to make any purchase of Element, and you will receive a free sample pack with all of the Element flavors. Once again, that's drinklmnt.com slash Invictus Mindset. And so if you're dealing with an, an issue that is time sensitive, there's, there's lapses there that diminish the actual quality of patient care. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, I mean, we can come back to that cause that's a whole big topic and, and there, you know, and, and the way that the allopathic system is supposed to work is the primary care provider is like the quarterback that is coordinating care between all of these different specialists. But in reality, that doesn't happen in the vast majority of cases. Primary care providers are just so overworked and overwhelmed. They have 2,500 patients on their roster. The point they're seeing, you know, 25, 30 patients in a day, just going from one appointment to the next, eight to 10 minutes. They've got families and life outside of their work, and, you know, they don't have time. Like, without just working 80 hour weeks, they don't have time to do that kind of coordination. And so, what happens is somebody goes to um, the gastroenterologist and they have a conversation with, with them about what's happening. Um, in their gut, but then they go see a, a, psycho a psychiatrist about their depression. And the psychiatrist and the gastroenterologist are not communicating. They, and there's no, uh, nobody's telling either the patient or the gastroenterologist or a psychiatrist that there's a strong connection between the gut and the brain. And maybe actually it's the SIBO or dysbiosis that that patient is experiencing that's, that's causing or driving the depression. And that by treating the the gut dis dysfunction, they could actually kill two birds with one stone and solve that problem. But that, that kind of collaboration and coordination is, is not happening in allopathic medicine. Whereas in functional medicine, 
we would look at those problems as, as connected, interconnected and indistinguishable in the sense that you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. And that's because we see the body as a system. And that's not, you know, functional medicine clinicians don't have a, a lock on that. You know, that, that's an insight that is, is in Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, naturopathic medicine. You know, almost all systems of traditional medicine looked at the body that way. So as functional medicine clinicians, we borrowed that insight from traditional medicine. And we've just reinforced it with modern research that has really clearly elucidated those connections in ways that you know, maybe traditional medicine wasn't yet aware of. So I look at functional medicine as a way of building on the past and what the incredible insights and, and um, approaches of traditional medicine and, and then adding the incredible insights uh, and, and lessons learned of modern medicine with our improved diagnostic tools and uh, better, in some cases, more evolved understanding of what's happening in the body, and then combining those two things together to provide the highest level of patient care that someone has really ever been able to experience in the history of humanity when it's done correctly. So that's that's what is really exciting about it for me. That, that's really cool. I, I, it's just brings up that when you find something isolated, it's typically connected to so many other things. And it, it's just challenging, in, in my humble opinion, to assume that, I mean, we see it in movement all the time. If you're having a left hip issue, maybe you check out the function of the right shoulder. Maybe you check out what's going on downstream at the feet. And you know, if you take that metaphor and bleed it into the medical approach that you're, you're referencing, it's, it's very cool to, to see that there's people out there that are looking at the whole system as one and not just isolating and solving just that one problem without taking into consideration everything else. So I appreciate the, the courage and the bravery because it's not as easy. Just to play devil's advocate, though, we are in a system where medical practitioners need to make a living. And problem solving and true patient care, treating the human, right? There's, there's emotions that come with that. There's historical reference. It takes time. And time, you know, for lack of a better phrase, time is money. And when you're spending lots of time on one patient trying to provide true, honest, and deep care, that limits the amount of patients you're able to see in a day. It traditionally, from my gentle understanding, does not fall under a health insurance model. So then you're not necessarily billing. These patients are paying out of pocket or they have like a specialized health insurance plan that can then pay for the services. What are your thoughts on, on that, right? Like my goal with this question is how do we minimize the barrier to entry for people to utilize the magic of functional medicine? But it sounds like it's very expensive. It takes a lot of time and is challenging for both the patient and the doctor. Yeah, it's a great question. It's really the the trillion dollar question, if you will, when you think about the the what's at stake here. Um, and I, I'm always just completely transparent about this. I don't know what the answer is. I have some ideas that I shared in my book and like directions that we can move in and things that could be done. And um, I think there are some really important uh, myths to debunk. You know, like one of them is. Functional medicine is is expensive. I'm using air quotes here for people that are just listening. Mm -hmm. um, it, if you look at like a, a chronic disease like diabetes, it costs about six thousand dollars a year, or it costs the healthcare system that at least you know the estimates vary six to eight thousand dollars a year to treat someone who who has type two diabetes. Kids as young as eight years old are now being di diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Uh, but let's say that someone's 30, 30, even just 40 years old, and they live another 40 years. You know, that, that's, we're talking about an astronomical uh, e expenditure over the lifetime of that patient. Now, if, you, if, if we spent even $5,000 up front to when that person, before that person developed type 2 diabetes, when they had either just high normal blood sugar or maybe prediabetes, when it's still very easy to reverse with diet and lifestyle changes, 
we could potentially save hundreds of thousands of dollars for the healthcare system. So it's partly a question of when, when we're investing in the most money in healthcare. If you wait, I mean, you know this well. I think you mentioned your brother is a is an emergency medicine physician. If if we wait until that that point in the spectrum, like if you if you imagine healthcare on a spectrum where you have, um you know, early intervention and prevention on one end, and then you have like super dramatic end of life I- intervention, you know, when someone's on their last legs mm-hmm. right now, the, the vast majority of our spending is towards this end of the spectrum, <laughs> the end of life, end of the spectrum, the, 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 the time when someone already has developed a chronic complex, chronic disease, that's very difficult to manage and maybe not even possible to reverse. If we shifted our spending to the earlier part of that spectrum, we could spend one one hundredth of what we're spending and get much better results. So, you know, in, in the context of this conversation, that there are so many things like that that need to be pointed out because you'll often hear people say, "Oh, well, functional medicine's not realistic because we can't afford it. It's too expensive." You know, it's people spending. Yeah, you know, and I I agree with that with the caveat that it's. It's too expensive for the individual. You know, it, we can't expect the average person to be able to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on a, an appointment with a functional medicine clinician and running that kind of testing. It is feasible to do within the healthcare system, but the amount of change that has to happen in terms of realigning incentives, getting the pharmaceutical influence out of medicine, at least to the extent that it is now today, restructuring the whole healthcare system. It, it's a massive undertaking. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm not um, unrealistic about that. And to be perfectly honest, there, it's, it's so challenging and so daunting that I, I, I sometimes wonder if we're going to have the, the, the political will to do it until until we have to. So so I I've, I've often said there's the e- easier way and the harder way. The easier way and by by no means easy, but the easier way is to take proactive action to make these changes and and turn the ship. The hard way is we we wait until the healthcare system essentially buckles under the weight of all of these influence, you know, the, uh, these these problems that I mentioned, which which it will eventually if we don't address it. And then we have to rebuild it at that point. That's much messier and much more difficult, but I think either way we'll eventually have to get to a better system because the one that we have right now is not, it's, it's broken from the inside out. It's not working for anybody. Absolutely. And I think we can both agree that it's, it's courageous and brave to pursue at the very least creating awareness around that and, enhancing educational opportunities for people to change their behavior. And I think one of the first changes in behavior is shifting the ideology to understand that contribution monetarily to your health is more of an investment than it is an expense. And I think if you do that proactively, you mitigate problems later on. And when you look at the majority of successful people in the world, it's leaning into this concept of delayed gratification. I'm going to go for the walk. I'm going to eat appropriate foods. I'm going to go to sleep earlier and maximize my eight hours of sleep and hydrate and try to stay away from alcohol and strive to practice ancestral living, knowing that it may not pay off right now, but it'll make the, the quality of my life over the course of time significantly enhanced and then minimize the monetary contribution later on. But I think because there's this fear-based, you have to have health insurance model, you are, you will be penalized, creates this, this nudge in that direction that then changes the narrative that you should believe in this versus this because there's this, this trust that I think was around for a very long time around the phrasing of, According to this research study, or listen to X, Y, and Z published in so-and-so, not taking into consideration who's funding those things, how the data is potentially being manipulated, 
and what they want the outcome to be because it directly correlates to sales and sales being something that helps uplift so many different things, including political reform and student loans and the, the power of big pharma, right? It brings up the big question, are we creating a society that has doctors that really care about trying to enhance patients and them healing, or are we creating drug dealers? And that's not to try to be offensive. I think there's plenty of great doctors out there, but it goes back to that quote that you shared. It's really challenging to shift the narrative when you know, the, the people that are being paid are, are being paid by pharmaceuticals and, and people that are manipulating the inputs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, that's the reality of the system that we have today. And, you know, apart from if you, if you just try to remove the emotion from it and just like look at it like a video camera might look at it, just, just pure observation, uh, and then with an understanding of human nature and how, and just an understanding of how this kind of influence impacts people's behavior it's an obvious outcome. Like we have the system that is the one that you could predict we would have when you set it up the way we set it up, right? So when you, when you allow pharmaceutical companies to be the primary f funding source of medical research, it doesn't take a genius to predict what is going to happen in that situation. It doesn't, uh, you don't have to be a cynic to understand what is likely to occur when the, the majority of funding for medical research is coming from pharmaceutical companies. It's going to be favorable to those companies because that's just very naturally how influence works in, for, for human beings in a, in a market capitalist society. Um, so, so there are choices that we've collectively made along the way, or, or, or you know, politicians have made and politicians that we've elected have made that have led to the system that we have. And so it's up to us to change that. And the, but it's not, you know, I, this is something I like to emphasize. I said it before and I'll say it again. It's not, it's not any individual, one, one person <laughs> that can change it, whether they're a doctor or a patient. Uh, and now the trouble is so many people, you know, when I said a few minutes ago that our system isn't working for anybody, that's not actually true. It's working enormously well <laughs> for some of the moneyed interests that are profiting from the system. And that's why yeah. it, perpetu it persists. If it wasn't working truly for anyone, we wouldn't have it. We'd have a different type of system. What I should have said is it's not working for patients and it's not working for doctors. Uh, it's working incredibly well for uh, pharmaceutical companies and other um, organizations that are profiting from the system. And they are so powerful they have so much political influence. The, the, the lobbying, the lobbyists employed by, I'm forgetting the exact numbers uh, from my book, but the influence they have is, I think, second only to the oil industry when it comes mm. to the number of lobbyists and the amount of money that is paid to these lobbyists. So, um, you know, politicians are incentivized in numerous ways to make decisions that are favorable to the pharmaceutical industry because of that. And so even if an individual voter or a group of voters want, would like to make a different choice, that might not be represented by their politician because the politician's campaign is funded um, you know, by pharmaceutical interests or, you know, it might be a I'll scratch your, your back if you scratch mine type of situation where there's, there's, you know, all kinds of decisions being made in the back rooms that we're not even aware of that, that are a result of this kind of influence. So... This is where I say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one person. I don't have the answer. I think there are some steps we could take to make things better that I outline in the book. But it's, it's, it's a, I like to distinguish between a problem and a predicament. A problem is something that has a solution. A predicament is, is a thorny, complex, and even sometimes mysterious set of challenges that don't lend themselves to one single solution or something that is easily fixed. And I think we're in a predicament here <laughs> more than a problem. Yeah, I agree, man. And you, you've done a really good job summarizing some of these things and 
sharing some of the incredible knowledge that's that's within your book on conventional medicine. And I really want to take a moment too to highlight that I'm sure there's some phenomenal doctors out there really implementing diet and lifestyle and habits and striving to elicit behavior change. And so I I don't, for for what it's worth, want to have this this episode come off as like a blanket statement where we're putting doctors and the whole medical industry down because I know there's some really good ones out there. And I, I hope you can continue to be brave and continue to do things that fit synergistically with true patient care and not just sick care and and the the money side of things. I also want to lean into education for a second where you're educated so much on on pharmaceuticals in medical school due to the legality fear. And then you look at doctors that are really working 80 plus hour weeks. You mentioned 8 to 10 minutes per patient, a roster of roughly 2500 people. By the time you get home after an 8, 12, or 24-hour shift, you're exhausted. You probably have a family. You have a, a life that you want to live, and you have you know, other spokes within your life wheel to put time, energy, and emotion into. With that being said, you're probably not doing a ton of continuing education. And, and then that makes it really challenging, right? Like, what is science? Science is the core principle of of uncertainty, which I've heard you say before. And that means that it's going to evolve over time. There's a hypothesis that that we want to challenge traditional views in order to move the needle in the right direction. This episode is brought to you by Mush. My friends over at Mush created an incredibly cool product of ready-to-eat overnight oats. And for those of you that listen to the podcast often, you know Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And Mush has done just that, as their products have no more than seven clean ingredients that are dairy-free, gluten-free, with no added sugar. Mush started right here at Invictus, as they had a vision to create convenient, healthy, and clean nutrition. And this landed them on Shark Tank, where the famous Mark Cuban invested in them. Now they're found in retailers all over the country, including Costco, Sprouts, Target, and Whole Foods. Check out my friends over at www.eatmush.com. And I think sometimes what happens is what you're learning in medical school is typically outdated in, in, from what I've read, three to five years. And so this continuing education model gets diluted due to lack of time, lack of energy, and doctors simply being overworked. What are your thoughts on potentials to help this a little bit? Do we need more doctors so that there's not as much short staffing? What is maybe your, your thought in this arena? Yeah, it's, I was smiling because I would say nutrition, what doctors learn about nutrition in medical school is outdated by 30 to 50 years. <laughs> if, you, if you were to see a nutrition textbook in wow. medical school, you'd be shocked. Um, mm-hmm. And it's probably more than three to five years for most things as well, other than maybe updated drug, you know, prescribing information for typical, you know, commonly used drugs. Uh, yeah, it's a huge problem. Uh, when I first started seeing patients, I, I, I never uh, worked more than three full days a week seeing patients. And, and even that felt like a lot. You know, I, I could not imagine how people could do f- five full eight-hour days of back-to-back patient treatments and still, first of all, just survive, you know, that's incredibly intense uh, from being in that position as a, as a, in a helping role and, and, and having eight hours of back to back 10, 12 minute appointments for five days a week is just crushing. It's, it's brutal. So, you know, I have great empathy for primary care providers and other doctors who are in that role because it's an incredibly difficult job. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, they're, they're definitely playing the role of hero. The majority yeah, of, of I mean, their day to day. It's not exaggeration that they are they are in a service role, and people say, "Oh, doctors make so much money." It's a really hard job, <laughs> and and it's, as you pointed out before, a lot of doctors graduate with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt from medical school, and it takes decades to to to, to make that back. Um, so, yeah, there's no they don't get paid 
to read the scientific research. So it, it's, I don't even think that's the reason, you know, but like, it, it's more that like you're exhausted after you've had eight hours of patient care. And, and like you said, you have family, you want to exercise, eat, you know, like take care of yourself in some way. What's going to motivate a doctor to go home and read research for a couple of hours? Uh, it's very challenging to incorporate that into a typical practice setting. And then you have the, and so what, what often ends up happening is the, the research that doctors are exposed to is what pharmaceutical reps are bringing to them on their visits. So pharmaceutical reps will visit doctors' offices, tell them about new medications or educate them about current medications. And those pharmaceutical brochures will have references or they'll bring studies. But obviously those studies are being cherry-picked or um, creatively interpreted, we, we could say. There, there actually has been some very interesting research that examined those pharmaceutical brochures and evaluated the veracity of the claims being made and even followed the references in the, in the brochures to see if they actually said what the brochure implied that they said. And you won't be surprised to learn that the accuracy of that information that was in those marketing brochures was very low and not rigorous at all. And so you have doctors that are being exposed, you know, to the, the, the majority of the research that they are seeing, unless they're actively pursuing it outside of their normal work hours is from pharmaceutical reps. So it's a huge mm -hmm. problem. And yeah, I mean, I think one solution would be having more doctors, which would then mean you know, doctors could work fewer hours and, uh, and have time for the research, but they would be paid to do that research. You know, it's not just like, hey, do this on your own time if you want to. It's like, it's that this is an integral part of your job. We recognize that. So we're going to pay you the same amount to do that, re you know, to, to review research for X number of hours a week as we're going to pay you for patient care. But I really do turn, think that like an allocation of hours per week for continuing education could be huge. It could especially, be. But, but, especially like if it's incentivized with uh, the same or close to the, the, the pay that they normally get. But here's the problem with that. If you're an HMO, you're, you're the CFO of an HMO, your job as, as, as a publicly traded company you have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit of that company. One way that you do that is you make sure that all of your employees are, are maxed out when it comes to income producing services that they're providing. <laughs> Reading research is not an income producing service. So if you, you know, allocate 10 hours a week of your primary care provider's time to reading research, that's not generating any income for the company. It's not generating profit. You could argue that under the conditions of our current system, you're now uh, not aligned with your fiduciary responsibility as the CEO or CFO or the person who's setting the policy of that company. And the same thing goes for just reducing the number of patients that a, a clinician sees. If you do that, well, then you're, you're generating fewer services that... Uh, produce revenue for the company and you're going to have lower profitability and that's bad for the corporation. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, 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 I believe in capitalism and I'm not coming to this from the perspective of we sh you know, we should, we should have socialized healthcare because I I've seen, you know, how that can go wrong as well in, in many other countries. But it, it's again, worth pointing out what the impacts of, the system that we have are so that we can try to figure out some way of addressing or mitigating those. You know, one possibility might be having more public funding that would uh, compensate, you know, that, that would make up for that difference or shortfall. I, I don't know. This It's not my area of expertise. You know, it would be kind of interesting, something that, uh, that comes to mind. I, I think we've all kind of heard the healthy argument around using data trackers to try to incentivize um, people to get some sort of discount in, in their health insurance. But you know what would be even in more interesting is if there was like a gamified approach between something like Blue Shield and Sharp and you saw based on whether it was wearables or blood panels 
and you saw tremendous improvement within the data and that incentivized certain public funding to, to go to that healthcare network to then enhance care. And then that would potentially incentivize better patient care because now with the continuing education, you're seeing, oh, wow, they're having reduced cholesterol, reduced blood pressure, and you're seeing things improve. They receive incentive for that. And then the other people are like, oh, we want to get that public funding. Let's try to produce better patient care over here. It might be interesting to see what the implementation of that could potentially look like. That's happening. Um, this is uh, a, the world of capitated payments. And Iora Health, uh, which is I-O-R-A, is was one of the pioneers in this approach. And they mm. um, started out by mostly focusing on patients with prediabetes and diabetes. And, and uh, their promise to payers was, hey, you can pay us X amount if we achieve this result. But if we achieve an even better result, you pay us Y amount. So they, they get a bonus. And then they're mm. incentivized to provide better care with better results for the patients. That's Whereas cool. in, the, in the typical system, there is no incentive to provide better care. In fact, you could argue that there's incentive to provide worse care, as I just said, like shortening appointment times is better for profits, so, with, but worse for patients. So that's a total misalignment of incentives. These capitated payment programs are an attempt to realign incentives so that when the, when the, the individual provider and the larger organization that that provider is a part of provide better care, they, that organization is rewarded for that better care. And so that's then obviously a win-win situation. And I do think that that is the only real path that I can see out of this is realigning incentives in that way. Yeah. Chris, it's been fun to chop it up with you around the healthcare narrative and tinkering and playing ping pong back and forth. But I want to take the conversation back to you and something that I know you're leaning heavily into right now, and that's nutrient density versus nutrient deficiency. What would you like people to know kind of on that topic? And what are some major takeaways that people can have? Yeah, thanks. So we were chatting about this a little bit before we started to record. And, um, you know, I've been working in this field for 15 years, and I've been honored to treat thousands of patients during that time from all, all, with all different kinds of problems and train thousands of practitioners around the world. And that's taught me a lot. Uh, and, and I would say one of the most important things that I have learned is that the amount of nutrients that we get in our daily diet is absolutely one of the most critical factors that determines our health. So it, and the, the problem with this is we know from current statistics that uh, 90, uh, over 90% of Americans don't get enough of a single, nu uh, not just one nutrient, but multiple different nutrients. And this is not something that's really talked about very much, even in the worlds of integrative and functional uh, medicine. And I think it's a, a major contributor to virtually all chronic diseases. Uh, and, and the problem exists not just for people with poor diet, which unfortunately most people in the industrialized world have a poor diet at this point. But even if you're eating a relatively healthy diet, it, uh, because of declining soil quality, growing toxic burden, and other challenges that we're facing in the modern world, you still are not getting the nutrients that you probably need. Uh, there's one statistic that I came across in my research that was pretty shocking, which was We'd have to eat eight oranges today to get the same nutrition that our grandparents got from eating a single orange. So that's mm. a change that has happened in two generations. We're not talking about hundreds or thousands of years. We're talking about two generations. And that, that decline in the nutrition in food has happened in that time period. So... <clears throat> Would you I'm accredit also, that to something like mass production, just creating a dilution of, of the concentration of nutrient density? 
Well, it's it's a it's a, it's a multiple factors, but one of them is is declining soil quality, and that is because we've disrupted the microbiome of the soil using chemical fertilizers and pesticides and industrial agriculture methods. So, mm. you know, our historical way of growing food was organic, and I, I mean that in the broadest sense of the term. <laughs> you know, it was, we didn't use chemical pesticides and fertilizers and herbicides, and we were <laughs> growing foods with traditional methods. And now with newer industrial methods and these chemicals that we apply to the soil, the, the produce, <coughs> excuse me, I have something in my throat, doesn't contain the same level of nutrition. Yeah, totally. I, I think the way you've hit the nail on the head there, I, I, I feel like we could do a complete other podcast talking about soil quality, how food is created, gut microbiome, and, and the role of fermented foods. And I'm, I'm just really excited that we got to connect today and chat it up around the healthcare narrative and what functional medicine is. If you were to give people some takeaways today, Chris, what are, what are some major highlights that you would leave them with? I think the biggest one is that we're, we have a lot more influence over our health than the, the conventional medical paradigm would lead us to believe. Uh, 90% of the risk of chronic disease comes down to environmental factors like diet and lifestyle. And that's, that's both good news and bad news. The, the bad news is that means it's up to you to largely to determine the health outcome of your life. The good news is it's up to you <laughs> to determine the health outcome of your life. <laughs> so it, 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 it's a great responsibility, and it means that you know, nobody's coming to save you. Like you, you actually have to work out your own salvation here in, in the sense that it's, up, it's largely the choices you make on a day-to-day -day basis that are going to determine the, the health outcome of your life. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying we have full control because that's a bit crazy and narcissistic. Uh, there are outside factors that impact our health that we don't have a lot of control over. But as I said, 90% of the risk of, of chronic disease is, is environmental factors that we have at least some control over. Um, but the, the good news, of course, around that is that we don't have to just be passive recipients of sick care in the current system and just wait until we get sick and accept that aging is going to be a slow, steady decline that we have no control over and that our life's just going to kind of continually get worse as we get older, which I think is the expectation that a lot of people have. We can actually not only preserve our health as we age, we can experience better health as we get older. I, I mentioned before I'm getting close to 50, but I feel like I have more energy and I'm more fit and I'm performing at a higher level than I was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And I've helped many uh, patients to uh, experience those same kind of benefits. And I think that's, that's fully within our power uh, if we apply ourselves to it. Makes me excited for the future, man. I appreciate you sharing that. As we conclude for today, my man, we've talked a lot about an optimal diet. What, what does that look like for you? What would you suggest people's diets specifically look like if maybe you were to give a gentle collection of, of foods? Yeah, I always like to start this conversation by with three words, eat real food. Because, you know, there's a lot of debate and controversy about, oh, should it be keto or carnivore or low carb or paleo or this or that? And yeah, I mean, we, we, can, we don't have enough maybe on another podcast we can get into those nuances, but I, totally. I firmly believe that if people would just greatly reduce or eliminate flour, sugar, and industrial seed oils and focus their diet predominantly on whole foods, any kind of whole foods, we would be in a completely different place than we're in uh, now as a, as a society. And you can look at cultures all around the world that have different types of whole food diets that are all thriving different proportions of protein, carbohydrates, fat, but they're all eating whole foods. They're doing great <laughs> compared to what we're doing. Now, within that whole food template, I tend to favor uh, diets that have a combination of plant and animal foods. I think that his, if you look at the history of, of, again, human evolution, and you look at modern research uh, and, and, and research on nutrient density and bioavailability, that 
a combination of animal and plant foods is the best option for the vast majority of people. The exact ratio of plants and animals will differ depending on people's goals and where they live, geography, climate, personal preference, etc. But something like an ancestral um, diet that combines meat, fish, nuts, seeds, vegetables, fruits, um, starchy tubers is, is really the best option, I think, for, for most of us. I couldn't agree more, man. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your time, and your energy today. Chris, where can people find you? Uh, ChrisCresser.com is my main site. Lots of free information there. My podcast, ebooks, articles, over 1,300 articles, I think, now from 15 years of doing this. And then my uh, supplement line is Adapt Naturals. So this is a, you know, a, a way of, of supplementing, as the term suggests, uh, whole food naturally occurring bioidentical nutrients to layer on top of a, of a good nutrient-dense diet. And I think that can go a long way to preserving our health in the future. All incredible value adds. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for doing this. We'll have to do it again soon. For those of you listening, you. if you enjoyed my conversation with Chris Cresser today, please rate, review, subscribe, and share with your friends. And as always, stay on the hunt for who you've not yet become. Till next time, guys. Are you over 35 and in need of a solid training program? Are you looking to improve your athleticism and keep up with the younger athletes in your CrossFit gym? Then look no further than our Invictus Masters program. This program places year-round emphasis on mobility and stability exercises with movements that we have seen directly benefit our master's athletes. Our program is led by Nicole DeHart and offers a training program designed specifically for master's athletes who are looking to compete at a higher level in the sport of CrossFit. Some of our top master's athletes in the world train with us, including CrossFit Games champion Kevin Kester, Matt Beals, and Pat Sprague. You can learn more about their stories and the Invictus Masters program by checking out their episodes right here on the Invictus Mindset Podcast. If you'd like more information about the current training cycle or to join the Invictus Masters program, please email Nicole at InvictusAthlete.com. That's N-I-C-H-O-L-E at InvictusAthlete.com. <laughs>